द महाभारत ऑफ कृष्ण अद्वैपयना translated into english prose from the original sanskrit text by pratap chandra roy cie this free ebook has been downloaded from holybooks.com udyoga purva section 11 sign yoga purva salya said then all the rishis and the superior gods said let the handsome nahusha be crowned as king of the gods He is powerful and renowned and devoted to virtue ever more. And they all went and said to him, O Lord of the earth, be thou our king. And Nahusha intent on his welfare, spoke to those gods and saints accompanied by the progenitors of mankind, I am feeble, I am not capable of protecting you. It is a powerful person who should be your king. It is Indra who hath always been possessed of strength. and all the gods led by the saints spoke again to him aided by the virtue of our austerities rule thou the kingdom of heaven there is no doubt that we have all our respective fears be crowned o lord of monarchs as the king of heaven whatever being may stand within thy sight whether he be a god an asura a yaksha a saint a pitri or a gandava thou shalt absorb his power and thereby wax strong always placing virtue before all other things be thou the ruler of the worlds protect also the brahmashas brahmana saints and the gods in heaven then o lord of monarchs nahusha was crowned king in heaven and placing virtue before everything else he became the ruler of all the worlds and though always of a virtuous disposition Yet when he obtained that precious boon and the kingdom of heaven Nahusha assumed a sensual turn of mind and when Nahusha became the king of the gods he surrounded himself with celestial nymphs and with damsels of celestial birth and took to enjoyments of various kinds in the Nandana groves on Mount Kailasa on the crest of Himavat on Mandara the white hills Sahya Mahendra and Malaya as also upon seas and rivers and he listened to various divine narratives that captivated both the ear and the heart and to the play of musical instruments of different sorts and to sweet vocal strains and viswavesu and nada and bevies of celestial nymphs and bands of gandavas and the six seasons in living shapes attended upon the king of the gods and fragrant breezes refreshingly cool blew round him and while that wretch was thus enjoying himself On one occasion the goddess who was the favorite queen of Indra came in his sight and that vicious soul having looked at her said to the courtiers why doth not this goddess the queen of Indra attend upon me i am the monarch of the gods and also the ruler of the worlds let sachi make haste and visit me at my house saddened at hearing this the goddess said to vrihaspati protect me O Brahmana from this Nahusha I come to you as my refuge You always say O Brahmana that I have got on my person all the auspicious marks being the favorite of the divine king that I am chaste devoted to my lord and destined never to become a widow All this about me you have said before Let your words be made true O possessor of great powers O lord You never spoke words that were vain. Therefore, O best of Brahmanas, this that you have said ought to be true. Then Vrihaspati said to the queen of Indra who was beside herself through fear, what thou hast been told by me will come to be true. Be sure, O goddess. Thou shalt see Indra, the lord of the gods, who will soon come back here. I tell thee truly, thou hast no fear from Nahusha. I shall soon unite thee with Indra. Now Nahusha came to hear that Indra's queen had taken refuge with Vrihaspati, the son of Anjiras. And at this, the king became highly enraged. The sense the 11th section in the Sainyodyoga Purva of the Yodyoga Purva. Section 12, Sainyodyoga Purva. Salya said, seeing Nahusha enraged, the gods led by the saints spoke unto him. who was now their king of awful mean o king of gods quit thy wrath 
When thou art in wrath, O Lord, the universe, with its Asuras and Gandavas, its Kinaras, and great snakes, quaked. Quit this wrath, thou righteous being, persons like thee do not put themselves out. That goddess is another person's wife. Be pacified, O Lord of Gods. Turn back thy inclination from the sin of outraging another's wife. Thou art the king of gods, prosperity to thee. Protect thy subjects in all righteousness. So addressed, he heeded not the saying rendered senseless by lust. And the king spoke to the gods, in allusion to Indra. Ahilya of spotless fame, the wife of a saint, was outraged by Indra while her husband was alive. Why did ye not prevent him? Many were the deeds of inhumanity, of unrighteousness, of deceit, committed by Indra in former times. Why did ye not prevent him? Let the goddess do my pleasure. That would be her permanent good. And so the same will evermore rebound to your safety, ye gods. The gods said, We shall bring to thee the queen of Indra even as thou hast laid the command, O Lord of heaven. Quit this wrath, thou valiant soul. Be pacified, O Lord of gods. Salya continued, Thus having spoken to him, the gods with the saints went to inform Drihaspati and the queen of Indra of the sad news. And they said, We know, O foremost of Brahmanas, that the queen of Indra hath betaken herself to thy house for protection, and that thou hast promised her protection, O best of divine saints. But we, the gods and Gandavas and saints beseech thee, O thou of great luster, to give up the queen of Indra to Nahusha. Nahusha, the king of gods, of great effulgence, is superior to Indra. Let her, that lady of choice figure and complexion, choose him as her lord. Thus addressed, the goddess gave vent to tears, and sobbing audibly, she mourned in piteous accents. And she spoke to Vrihaspati, O best of divine saints, I do not desire Nahusha to be my lord. I have betaken myself to thy protection, O Brahmana. Deliver me from this great peril. Vrihaspati said, My resolution is this, I shall not abandon one that hath sought my protection. O thou of unblameable life, I shall not abandon thee, virtuous as thou art and of a truthful disposition. I do not desire to do an improper act, especially as I am a Brahmana, knowing what righteousness is, having a regard for truth, and aware also of the precepts of virtue. I shall never do it. Go your ways, ye best of gods. Hear what hath formerly been sung by Brahma with regard to the matter at hand. He that delivereth up to a foe of a person terrified and asking for protection obtaineth no protection when he himself is in need of it. His seed doth not grow at seed time and rain doth not come to him in the season of rains. He that delivereth up to a foe a person terrified and asking for protection never succeedeth in anything that he undertaked, senseless as he is, he droppeth paralyzed from heaven, the gods refuse offerings made by him. His progeny die an untimely death and his forefathers always quarrel among themselves. The gods with Indra at their head dart the thunderbolt at him. Know it to be so, I shall not deliver up this Sachi here, the queen of Indra, famous in the world as his favorite consort. O ye best of gods, what may be for both her good and mine I ask you to do. Sachi I shall never deliver up. Salya continued, then the gods and the Gandavas said these words to the preceptor of the gods, O Vrihaspati, deliberate upon something that may be conformable to sound policy. Vrihaspati said, Let this goddess of auspicious looks ask for time from Nahusha in order to make up her mind to his proposal. This will be for the good of Indra's queen, and of us as well. Time, ye gods, may give rise to many impediments. Time will send time onward. Nahusha is proud and powerful by virtue of the boon granted to him. Salya continued. 
Drihaspati having spoken so, the gods, delighted then said, Well hast thou said, O Brahmana. This is for the good of all the gods. It is no doubt so. Only, let this goddess be propitiated. Then the assembled gods led by Agni, with a view to the welfare of all the worlds, spoke to Indra's queen in a quiet way. And the gods said, Thou art supporting the whole universe of things mobile and immobile. Thou art just and true, go thou to Nahusha. That vicious being, lustful after thee, will shortly fall, and Indra, O goddess, will get the sovereignty of the gods. Ascertaining this to be the result of that deliberation, Indra's queen, for attaining her end, went bashfully to Nahusha of awful mien. The vicious Nahusha also, rendered senseless by lust, saw how youthful and lovely she was and became highly pleased. Thus ends the twelfth section in the Sainyodhyoga Purva of the Yodhyoga Purva. Section 13, Sainyodhyoga Purva. Salya said, Now then Nahusha, the king of the gods, looked at her and said, O thou of sweet smiles, I am the Indra of all the three worlds. O thou of beautiful things and fair complexion, accept me as thy lord. That chaste goddess, thus addressed by Nahusha, was terrified and quaked like a plantain stalk at a breezy spot. She bowed her head to Brahma and joining her hands spoke to Nahusha, the king of the gods, of awful mean, said O lord of the deities, I desire to obtain time. It is not known what hath become of Indra or where he is. Having inquired into the truth regarding him, if O Lord, I obtain no news of him, then I shall visit thee, this tell I thee for truth. Thus addressed by Indra's queen, Nahusha was pleased. And Nahusha said, Let it be so, O lady of lovely hips, even as thou art telling me. Thou wilt come after having ascertained the news. I hope thou wilt remember thy plighted truth. Dismissed by Nahusha, she of auspicious looks stepped out and that famous lady went to the abode of Drihaspati. And O best of kings, the gods with Agni at their head, when they heard her words, deliberated, intent upon what would promote the interests of Indra. And they then joined the powerful Vishnu, the god of gods. And skilled in making speeches, the uneasy gods spoke the following words to him, Indra. The Lord of all the gods, hath been overpowered by the sin of Brahmanicide. Thou, O Lord of the gods, art the firstborn, the ruler of the universe, and our refuge. Thou hadst assumed the form of Vishnu for the protection of all beings. When Vritra was killed through thy energy, Indra was overwhelmed by the sin of Brahmanicide. O best of all the gods, prescribe the means of setting him free. Having heard these words of the gods, Vishnu said, Let Indra offer sacrifice to me. Even I shall purify the holder of the thunderbolt. The chastiser of Paka, having performed the holy horse sacrifice, will fearlessly regain his dignity as lord of the gods. And the wicked-minded Nahusha will be led to destruction by his evil deeds. For a certain period ye gods, ye must be patient, being vigilant at the same time. Having heard these words of Vishnu, words that were true and pleasant like ambrosia to their ears, the gods with their preceptor and with the rishis proceeded to that spot where Indra was uneasy with fear. And there O king, was performed a great horse sacrifice, capable of removing the sin of Brahmanicide, for the purification of the high-minded and great Indra. And the lord of the gods, O Yudhisthira, divided the sin of Brahmanicide among trees and rivers and mountains and the earth and women. And having distributed it thus among those beings and parted with it, Indra was free from fever. And rid of his sin, he came to himself. And at that place, the slayer of the Asura Vala, quaked when he looked at Nahusha, before whom all animated beings felt cowed and who was unapproachable by virtue of the boon the rishis had granted to him. And the divine husband of Sachi vanished from sight once again. 
and invisible to all beings, he wandered biding his time. And Indra having disappeared, Sachi fell into grief. And exceedingly miserable, she bewailed, Alas! O Indra! If ever I have made a gift, or made offering to the gods, or have propitiated my spiritual guides, if there is any truth in me, then I pray that my chastity may remain inviolate. I bow myself to this goddess night, holy, pure, running her course during this the northern journey of the sun, I let my desire be fulfilled. Saying this, she in a purified condition of body and soul, worshipped the goddess night. And in the name of her chastity and truth she had recourse to divination. And she asked, show me the place where the king of the gods is. Let truth be verified by truth. And it was thus that she addressed the goddess of divination. Thus ends the thirteenth section in the Sainyodhyoga Purva of the Yodhyoga Purva. Section 14, Sainyodhyoga Purva. Salya said, then the goddess of divination stood near that chast and beautiful lady. And having beheld that goddess, youthful and lovely, standing before her, Indra's queen, glad at heart, paid respects to them and said, I desire to know who thou art, O thou of lovely face. And divination said, I am divination, O goddess, who hath come near thee. Since thou art truthful therefore, O high-minded lady, do I appear in thy sight. Since thou art devoted to thy lord, employed in controlling thyself, and engaged in the practice of religious rites, I shall show thee the god Indra, the slayer of Dhritra. Quickly come after me, so may good but I thee. Thou shalt see that best of gods. Then divination proceeded and the divine queen of Indra went after her. And she crossed the heavenly groves, and many mountains and then having crossed the Himavat mountains, she came to its northern side. And having reached the sea, extending over many yojana, she came upon a large island covered with various trees and plants. And there she saw a beautiful lake of heavenly appearance, covered with birds, 800 miles in length, and as many in breadth. And upon it, O descendant of Bharata, were full-blown lotuses of heavenly appearance of five colors, hummed round by bees, and counting by thousands. And in the middle of that lake, there was a large and beautiful assemblage of lotuses having in its midst a large white lotus standing on a lofty stalk, and penetrating into the lotus stalk, along with Sachi. She saw Indra there who had entered into its fibers. And seeing her lord lying there in a minute form, Sachi also assumed a minute form, so did the goddess of divination too. And Indra's queen began to glorify him by reciting his celebrated deeds of yore. And thus glorified, the divine Purandara spoke to Sachi. For what purpose hast thou come? How also have I been found out? Then the goddess spoke of the acts of Nahusha. And she said, O performer of a hundred sacrifices, having obtained the sovereignty of the three worlds, powerful and haughty and of a vicious soul, he hath commanded me to visit him, and the cruel wretch hath he even assigned me a definite time. If thou wilt not protect me, O Lord, he will bring me under his power. For this reason, o Indra, have I come to thee in alarm. O thou of powerful arms, slay the terrible Nahusha of vicious soul. Discover thyself, O slayer of Deityas and Denavas, O Lord assume thy own strength and rule the celestial kingdom. Thus ends the fourteenth section in the Sainyodhyoga Purva of the Yodhyoga Purva. Section 15, Sainyodhyoga Purva. Salya said, thus addressed by Sachi, the illustrious God said to her again, this is not the time for putting forth valor. Nahusha is stronger than I am. O beautiful lady, he hath been strengthened by the rishis with the merits of offerings to the gods and the tris. I shall have recourse to policy now. Thou wilt have to carry it out, O goddess. O lady, thou must do it secretly and must not disclose it to any person. 
lady of a beautiful waist, going to Nahusha in private, tell him, O Lord of the Universe, thou must visit me mounted on a nice vehicle borne by Rishis. In that case I shall be pleased and shall place myself at thy disposal. This shouldst thou tell him. And thus addressed by the king of the gods, his lotus-eyed consort expressed her consent and went to Nahusha. And Nahusha, having seen her, smilingly addressed her, saying, I welcome thee, O lady of lovely thighs. What is thy pleasure, O thou of sweet smiles? Accept me, O lady of propitious looks, who am devoted to thee. What is thy will, O spirited dame? I shall do thy wish, O lady of propitious looks and slender waist. Nor needst thou be bashful, O thou of lovely hips. Have trust in me. In the name of truth I swear, O goddess, that I shall do thy bidding. Sachi said, O lord of universe, I wanted the time that thou hast assigned to me. Thereafter O lord of the gods, thou shalt be my husband. I have a wish, attend and hear O king of the gods, what it is I shall say O king, so that thou mayst do what I like. This is an indulgence that I ask from thy love for me. If thou grantest it, I shall be at thy disposal. Indra had horses for carrying him and elephants and cars. I want thee to have O king of the gods, a novel vehicle, such as never belonged to Vishnu or Rudra, or the Asuras or the Rakshasas, O Lord. Let a number of highly dignified rishis, united together, bear thee in a palanquin. This is what commends itself to me. Thou shouldst not liken thyself to the Asuras or the gods. Thou absorbest the strength of all by thy own strength as soon as they look at thee. There is none so strong as to be able to stand before thee. Salya continued, thus addressed, Nahusha was very much pleaded. And the Lord of the Deities said to that lady of faultless features, O lady of the fairest complexion, thou hast spoken of a vehicle never heard of before. I like it exceedingly, O Goddess. I am in thy power, O thou of lively face. He cannot be a feeble person who employeth rishis for bearing him. I have practiced austerities and am mighty. I am the lord of the past, the present, and the future. The universe would be no more if I were in rage. The whole universe is established in me. O thou of sweet smiles, the gods, the asuras and gandavas and snakes and rakshasas are together unable to cope with me when I am in rage. Whomsoever I gaze upon I divest him of his energy. Therefore, thy request I shall no doubt fulfill O Goddess. The seven rishis, and also the regenerate rishis, shall carry me. See our greatness and splendor, O lady of lovely complexion. Salya continued, having thus addressed that Goddess of lovely face, and having dismissed her thus, he harnessed to his heavenly car a number of saints devoted to the practice of austerities. A disregarder of Brahmans, endued with power and intoxicated with pride, capricious, and of vicious soul, he employed those saints to carry him. Meanwhile dismissed by Nahusha, Sachi went to Vrihaspati and said, But little remaineth of the term assigned by Nahusha to me. Be compassionate unto me who respect thee so and quickly find out Indra. The illustrious Vrihaspati then said to her, Very good, thou needst not O goddess fear Nahusha of vicious soul. Surely he shall not long retain his power. The wretch in fact is already gone, being regardless of virtue and because, O lovely dame, of his employing the great saints to carry him. And I shall perform a sacrifice for the destruction of this vicious wretch and I shall find out Indra. Thou needst not fear. Fare thee well. And Vrihaspati of great power then kindled a fire in the prescribed form and put the very best offerings upon it in order to ascertain where the king of the gods was. And having put his offerings O king, he said to the fire, Search out Indra. And thereupon that revered god, the eater of burnt offerings, 
assumed of his own accord a wonderful feminine form and vanished from sight at that very spot. And endued with speed of the mind, he searched everywhere, mountains and forests, earth and sky, and came back to Vrihaspati within the twinkling of the eye. And Agni said, Vrihaspati, nowhere in these places do I find the king of the gods. The waters alone remain to be searched, I am always backward in entering the waters. I have no ingress therein. O Brahmana what am I to do for thee? The preceptor of the gods then said to him, O illustrious god, do thou enter the water. Agni said, I cannot enter the water. Therein it is extinction that awaits me. I place myself in thy hand, O thou of great effulgence. Mayst thou fare well. Fire rose from water, the military caste rose from the priestly caste, and iron had its origin in stone. The power of these, which can penetrate all other things, heart no operation upon the sources from which they spring. Thus ends the 15th section in the Sainyodhyoga Purva of the Yodhyoga Purva. Section 16, Sainyodhyoga Purva. Vrihaspati said, Thou art the mouth, O Agni, of all the gods. Thou art the carrier of sacred offerings. Thou, like a witness, hast access to the inner souls of all creatures. The poets call thee single, and again threefold. O eater of burnt offerings, abandoned by thee the universe would forthwith cease to be. The Brahmanas by bowing to thee, win with their wives and sons an eternal region, the reward of their own meritorious deeds. O Agni, it is thou who art the bearer of sacred offerings. Thou, O Agni, art thyself the best offering. In a sacrificial ceremony of the Supreme Order, it is thee that they worship with incessant gifts and offerings. O bearer of offerings, having created the three worlds, thou when the hour cometh, consumeth them in thy unkindled form. Thou art the mother of the whole universe, and thou again, O Agni art its termination. The wise call thee identical with the clouds and with the lightning, flames issuing from thee, support all creatures. All the waters are deposited in thee, so is this entire world. To thee, O purifier, nothing is unknown in the three worlds. Every body take kindly to his progenitor, do thou enter the waters without fear. I shall render thee strong with the eternal hymns of the Ved. Thus glorified, the bearer of burnt offerings, that best of poets, well pleased, spoke laudable words to Vrihaspati. And he said, I shall show Indra to thee. This I tell thee for truth. Salya continued, Then Agni entered the waters, including seas and tiny ponds, and came to that reservoir where, O oh best of Bharata's race, while searching the lotus flowers, he saw the king of the gods lying within the fibers of a lotus stalk. And soon coming back he informed Vrihaspati how Indra had taken refuge in the fibers of a lotus stalk, assuming a minute form. Then Vrihaspati, accompanied by the gods, the saints and the Gandavas, went and glorified the slayer of Vala by referring to his former deeds. And he said, O Indra, the great Asura Namuchi was killed by thee, and those two Asuras also of terrible strength, Visti Samvara and Vala. Wax strong O performer of a hundred sacrifices, and slay all thy force. Rise O Indra. Behold here are assembled the gods and the saints. O Indra, O great lord, by slaying Asuras, thou hast delivered the worlds. Having got the froth of waters, strengthened with Vishnu's energy, thou formerly slew Vritra. Thou art the refuge of all creatures and art adorable. There is no being equal to thee. All the creatures, O Indra, are supported by thee. Thou didst build the greatness of the gods. Deliver all, together with the worlds by assuming thy strength, O great Indra. And thus glorified, Indra increased little by little, and having assumed his own form, he waxed strong and spoke to the preceptor Vrihaspati standing before. 
and he said, What business of yours yet remaineth? The great Asura, son of Tvashtri, hath been killed in Dhritra also, whose form was exceedingly big and who destroyed the worlds. Vrihaspati said, The human Nahusha, a king, having obtained the throne of heaven by virtue of the power of the divine saints, is giving us exceeding trouble. Indra said, How hath Nahusha obtained the throne of heaven, difficult to get? What austerities did he practice? How great is his power, O Vrihaspati? Vrihaspati said, The gods having been frightened, wished for a king of heaven, for thou hadst given up the high dignity of heaven's ruler. Then the gods, the Pitris of the universe, the saints and the principal Gandavas all met together, O Indra, and went to Nahusha and said, Be thou our king and the defender of the universe. To them said Nahusha, I am not able, fill me with your power and with the virtue of your austerities. So told, the deities strengthened him, O king of the gods. And thereupon Nahusha became a person of terrible strength and becoming thus the ruler of the three worlds, he hath put the great saints in harness and the wretches thus journeying from world to world. Mayst thou never see Nahusha, who is terrible. He emiteth poison from his eyes and absorbeth the energy of all. All the gods are exceedingly frightened, they go about concealed and do not cast a glance at him. Salya continued, while that best of Anjira's race was thus speaking, there came that guardian of the world, Kuvara, and also Yama the son of Surya, and the old god Soma and Varuna. And arrived there they said to the great Indra, how lucky that the son of Tvashtri hath been killed and Vritra also. How lucky, O Indra, that we are beholding thee safe and sound, while all thy enemies have been killed. Indra received all those guardians of the worlds and with a glad heart greeted them in proper form with a view to requesting them in connection with Nahusha. And he said, Nahusha of terrible mien is the king of the gods, therein lend me your assistance. They replied, Nahusha is of awful mien, his sight is poison, we are afraid of him, O God. If thou overthrowest Nahusha, then we shall be entitled to our shares of sacrificial offerings, O Indra. Indra said, Let it be so. You and the ruler of the waters and Yama and Kuvara shall this day be crowned along with me. Aided by all the gods, let us overthrow the four Nahusha of terrible gaze. Then Agni also said to Indra, Give me a share in sacrificial offerings. I also shall lend you my assistance. Indra said to him, O Agni, thou also shalt get a share in great sacrifices, there will be a single share in such for both Indra and Agni. Salya continued. Thus did the illustrious Lord Indra, the chastiser of Paka, the giver of boons, bestow, after deliberation, upon Kuvara the sovereignty over the Yakshas and all the wealth of the world, upon Yama, the sovereignty over the Pitris, and upon Varuna, that over the waters. Thus ends the sixteenth section in the Sainyodhyoga Purva of the Yodhyoga Purva. Section 17, Sainyodhyoga Purva Salya said, Now, when the great Indra, the intelligent chief of the gods, was deliberating with the guardians of the world and other deities upon the means of slaying Nahusha, there appeared at that spot the venerable ascetic Agastya. And Agastya honored the lord of the gods and said, How fortunate that thou art flourishing after the destruction of that being of universal form, as also that of Dhritra. And how fortunate, O Purandara, Nahusha hath been hurled from the throne of heaven. How fortunate, O slayer of Vala, that I behold thee with all thy enemies killed. Indra said, Hath thy journey hither been pleasant, O great saint? I am delighted to see thee. Accept from me water for washing thy feet and face, as also the agya and the cow. Salya continued, Indra, well pleased, began to question that best of saints and greatest of brahmanas when he was seated on a seat after receiving due honors thus, O revered saint, O best of brahmanas, 
I wish to have it recited by thee how Nahusha of vicious soul was hurled from heaven. Agastya said, Listen Indra to the pleasant narrative how the wicked and vicious Nahusha, intoxicated with pride of strength, had been hurled from heaven. The pure-spirited Brahmanas and celestial saints, while carrying him, weary with toil, questioned that vicious one, O best of victors, saying, O Indra, there are certain hymns in the waves, directed to be recited while sprinkling the cows. Are they authentic or not? Nahusha, who had lost his senses by the operation of the Tamas, told them that they were not authentic. The saints then said, Thou art tending towards unrighteousness, thou takest not to the righteous path. The greatest saints have formerly said that they are authentic, O Indra. And incited by untruth, he touched me on my head with his foot. At this, O Lord of Sachi, he became divested of power and of good looks. Then, as he was agitated and overpowered with fear, I spoke to him, since thou hast pronounced as spurious the unexceptionable hymns of the Ved, which have been recited by Brahmarshis, Brahmana saints, and since thou hast touched my head with thy foot and since thou, O ignorant wretch, hast turned these unapproachable saints, equal to Brahma, into animals for carrying thee. Therefore O wretch, be divested of thy luster, and being hurled headlong, fall thou from heaven, the effect of all thy good deeds being exhausted. For ten thousand years, thou shalt, in the form of an enormous snake, roam over the earth. When that period is full, thou mayst come back to heaven. Thus hath that wretch been hurled from the throne of heaven, O repressor of force. How fortunate, O Indra, that we are flourishing now. That thorn of the Brahmana's heart been killed. O Lord of Sachi, repair thou to heaven, protect the worlds, subdue thy senses, subdue thy force, and be glorified by the great saints. Salya continued, Then, O ruler of men, the gods and the bands of great saints were exceedingly pleased. And so also were the Pitris, the Yakshas, the snakes, Rakshasas, the Gandavas and all the bands of celestial nymphs. And the tanks, the rivers, the mountains, and the seas also were highly pleased. And all came up and said, How fortunate, O slayer of force, that thou art flourishing! How fortunate that the intelligent Agastya heart killed the vicious Nahusha! How fortunate that the vile individual heart been turned into a snake to roam over the earth! Thus ends the 17th section in the Sainyodhyogapurva of the Yodhyogapurva. Section 18, Sainyodhyogapurva. Salya said, Then Indra, glorified by the bands of Gandavas and celestial nymphs, mounted on a Ravata, the king of elephants, characterized by auspicious marks. And the illustrious Agni, and the great saint Drihaspati and Yama and Varuna and Kuvara, the lord of riches, accompanied him. And the Lord Sakra, the slayer of Dhritra, then went to the three worlds, surrounded by the gods together with the Gandavas and the celestial nymphs. And the performer of a hundred sacrifices, the king of the deities, was thus united with his queen. And he began to protect the worlds with exceeding gladness. Then the illustrious divine saint Anjiras arrived in the assembly of Indra and worshipped him duly by reciting the hymns of the Atava. And the great Lord Indra became Sati's six head and granted a boon to the Atava Anjiras. And Indra said, Thou wilt be known as Sarishi of the name Atava Anjiras in the Atava Ved and thou wilt also get a share in sacrifices. And having honoured Atava Anjiras thus, the great Lord Indra, the performer of a hundred sacrifices, parted with him O great king. And he honoured all the deities and all the saints endued with wealth of asceticism. And O king, Indra, well pleased governed the people virtuously. Thus was misery endured by Indra with his wife. And with the view of slaying his foes, even he had to pass a period in concealment. Thou shouldst not take it to heart that thou, 
O King of Kings, hast suffered with Drampadi as also with thy hyrninded brothers in the great forest. O King of Kings, O descendant of Bharata, O delight of Guru's race, thou wilt get back thy kingdom in the same way as Sindra got his, after having killed Dhritra. The vicious Nahusha, that enemy of Brahmanas, of evil mind, was overthrown by the curse of Agastya, and reduced to nothing for endless years. Similarly, O slayer of force, thy enemies, Karna and Duryodhana and others of vicious souls will quickly be destroyed. Then O hero, thou wilt enjoy the whole of this earth, as far as the sea with thy brothers and this Draupadi. This story of the victory of Indra, equal to the Ved in its sacred character, should be listened to by a king desirous of victory and when his forces have been arrayed in order of battle. Therefore, O best of victors, I am reciting it to thee for thy victory, O Yudhishthira. High-souled persons attain prosperity when they are glorified. O Yudhishthira, the destruction of high-souled Kshatriyas is at hand by reason of the crimes of Duryodhana, and through the might also of Bhima and Arjuna. He who readeth this story of Indra's victory with a heart full of religious faith, is cleansed of his sins, attaineth a region of bliss, and obtaineth joy both in this world and in the next. He hath no fear of his foes, he never becometh a sunless man, never encountereth any peril whatever and enjoyeth long life. Everywhere victory declareth for him, and he knoweth not what defeat is. Vesampayana continued, O best of Bharata's race, the king, that best of righteous men, thus encouraged by Salya, honored him in proper form. And Yudhishthira, the son of Kunti, of powerful arms, having heard the words of Salya, spoke to the king of the Madras the following words, There is no doubt that thou wilt act as the charioteer of Karna. Thou must damp the spirits of Karna then by recounting the praises of Arjuna. Salya said, Let it be so. I shall do just as thou tellest me. And I shall do for thee anything else that I may be able to do. Vesampayana continued, Then Salya, the king of the Madras, bade farewell to the sons of Kunti. And that handsome man then went with his army to Duryodhana, or repressor of force. Thus ends the 18th section in the Sainyodhyoga Purva of the Yodhyoga Purva. Section 19, Sainyodhyoga Purva. Vesampayana said, then Yudhana, the great hero of the Satvata race, came to Yudhishthira with a large army of foot and horses and cars and elephants. And his soldiers of great valor come from various lands, bore various weapons of war and heroic in look, they beautified the Pandava army. And that army looked splendid by reason of battle axe and missiles and spears and lances and mallets and clubs and staves and cords and stainless swords and daggers and arrows of various kinds, all of the best temper. And the army, beautified by those weapons and resembling in color the cloudy sky, assumed an appearance like to a mass of clouds with lightning flashes in its midst. And the army counted an akshohini of troops. And when absorbed in the troops of Yudhishthira it entirely disappeared, as dot a small river when it enters the sea. And similarly, the powerful chief of the Chedis, Drishteketu, accompanied by an Akshohini, came to the sons of Pandu of immeasurable strength. And the king of Magadha, Jayatsana of great strength, brought with him for Yudhishthira an Akshohini of troops. And similarly Pandya, who dwelt on the coastland near the sea, came accompanied by troops of various kinds to Yudhishthira, the king of kings. And O king, when all these troops had assembled, his army, finely dressed and exceedingly strong, assumed an appearance pleasant to the eye. And the army of Drupada also was beautified by valiant soldiers who had come from various lands, and also by his mighty sons. And similarly Virata, the king of the Matsyas, a leader of troops, accompanied by the king of the hilly regions, came to Pandu's sons. And for the high-souled sons of Pandu there were thus assembled from various directions, 
seven akshohini of troops, bristling with banners of various forms. And eager to fight with the Kurus, they gladdened the hearts of the Pandavas. And in the same way King Bhagadatta, gladdening the heart of Dhritarashtra's son, gave an akshohini of troops to him. And the unassailable mass of his troops, crowded with chins and kiratas, all looking like figures of gold, assumed a beauty like to that of a forest of Karnikara trees. And so the valiant Burishravas, and Salya, O son of Guru, came to Duryodhana, with an akshohini of troops each. And Kritavaman, the son of Hridika, accompanied by the Bojas, the Andas, and the Kukuras, came to Duryodhana with an akshohini of troops. And the body of his troops composed of those mighty soldiers, who wore on their persons garlands of many colored flowers, looked as graceful as a number of sportive elephants that have passed through a wood. And others led by Jayadrata, the dwellers of the land of Sindhu Sovitra, came in such force that the hills seemed to tremble under their tread. And their force, counting an Akshohini, looked like a mass of clouds moved by the wind. And Sudakshina, the king of the Kambojas, or ruler of men, accompanied by the Yavanas and Sakas, came to the Guru chief with an Akshohini of troops. And the body of his troops that looked like a flight of locusts, meeting with the Guru force, was absorbed and disappeared in it. And similarly came King Nila, the resident of the city of the Mahishmati, with mighty soldiers from the southern country who carried weapons of pretty make. And the two kings of Avanti, accompanied by a mighty force, brought to Duryodhana each a separate Akshohini of troops. And those tigers among men, the five royal brothers, the princes of Kekaya, hastened to Duryodhana with an Akshohini of troops, and gladdened his heart. And from the illustrious kings of Adair quarters there came, O best of Bharata's race, three large divisions of troops. And thus Duryodhana had a force which numbered eleven Akshohini, all eager to fight with the sons of Kunti, and bristling with banners of various forms. And O descendant of Bharata, there was no space in the city of Hastinapura even for the principal leaders of Duryodhana's army. And for this reason the land of the five rivers, and the whole of the region called Kurujangala. And the forest of Rohitaka which was uniformly wild, and Ahichatra, and Kalakuta, and the banks of the Ganga, and Varana, and Vatadana, and the hill tracts on the border of the Yamuna the whole of this extensive tract full of abundant corn and wealth, was entirely overspread with the army of the Kauravas. And that army, so arranged, was beheld by the priest who had been sent by the king of the Panchalas to the Kurus. Thus ends the 19th section in the Sainyodhyoga Purva of the Yodhyoga Purva. Section 20, Sainyodhyoga Purva. Vesampayana said, then Drupada's priest, having approached the Korava chief was honored by Dhritarashtra, as also by Bhishma and Vidura. And having first told the news of the welfare of the Pandavas, he inquired about the welfare of the Koravas. And he spoke the following words in the midst of all the leaders of Duryodhana's army, The eternal duties of kings are known to you all. But though known, I shall yet recite them as an introduction to what I am going to say. Both Dhritarashtra and Pandu are known to be sons of the same father. There is no doubt that the share of each to the paternal wealth should be equal. The sons of Dhritarashtra obtained the paternal wealth. Why did not the sons of Pandu at all receive their paternal portion? Ye are aware how formerly the sons of Pandu did not receive their paternal property, which was all usurped by Dhritarashtra's sons. The latter endeavored in various ways to remove the sons of Pandu from their path by employment even of murderous contrivances, but as their destined terms of life had not wholly run out, the sons of Pandu could not be sent to the abode of Yama. Then again, when those high-souled princes had carved out a kingdom by their own strength, the mean-minded sons of Dhritarashtra, aided by Suvila's son, robbed them of it by deceit. 
This Dhritarashtra gave his sanction even to that act as hath been usual with him. And for thirteen years they were then sent to sojourn in the great wilderness. In the council hall, they had also been subjected to indignities of various kinds, along with their wife, valiant though they were. And great also were the sufferings that they had to endure in the woods. Those virtuous princes had also to endure unspeakable woes in the city of Virata, such as are endured only by vicious men when their souls transmigrate into the forms of inferior beings. Ye best of Kuru's race, overlooking all these injuries of your they desire nothing but a peaceful settlement with the Kuru's. Remembering their behavior and that of Duryodhana also, the latter's friends should entreat him to consent to peace. The heroic sons of Pandu are not eager for war with the Kurus. They desire to get back their own share without involving the world in ruin. If Dhritarashtra's son assigns a reason in favor of war, that can never be a proper reason. The sons of Pandu are more powerful. Seven Akshohinis of troops have been collected on behalf of Yudhishthira, all eager to fight with the Kurus, and they are now awaiting his word of command. Others there are, tigers among men, equal in might to a thousand Akshohinis, such as Satyaki and Bimasina, and the twin brothers of mighty strength. It is true that these eleven divisions of troops are arrayed on one side, but these are balanced on the other by the mighty armed Dhananjaya of manifold form. And as Kiritin exceeds in strength even all these troops together, so also dot Vasudeva's son of great effulgence and powerful intellect. Who is there that would fight, in view of the magnitude of the opposing force, the valor of Arjuna, and the wisdom of Krishna? Therefore, I ask you to give back what should be given, as dictated by morality and compact. Do not let the opportunity pass. Thus ends the 20th section in the sign Yodhyoga Purva of the Yodhyoga Purva. If you enjoyed this audiobook, please like and subscribe to be notified of when new audiobooks are uploaded. Thank you for listening and learning. Shanti.